We are Marion's Learning Set. I'm Claire. I study uh, work in business. Christina, uh, Simone, Martha, and Victor. And you'll notice we have two absent members. Uh, Nikki, who has moved on to another university. Which one? Um, I'm not say. And Miriam, who's had a baby. <laughs> Both of which we consider to be moderately reasonable, uh, what you might call mitigating circumstances. <laughs> not being his best. Oh, we think so. We don't know. Well, we guess that she's too busy to tell us. Um, but both of them have contributed to our session, and they have, we've actually recorded uh, audio clips of them presenting their bits, so that hence the slight technical difficulties at the start, trying to persuade uh, the Brooks system to recode what we've done. So we have uh, two things to say in terms of our objectives. Um, the first is uh, in terms of content. We're going to talk about um, student engagement, and we've selected, obviously it's a very broad topic, but we've focused in on a few issues. The first is the idea of threshold concepts and troublesome knowledge and how you can deal with that in the classroom. Um, the second is diversity, which we're going to explore together. And the third is technology, which actually links quite nicely to what we were just talking about with digital literacies. In terms of our objectives, um, the other thing we wanted to talk about was our kind of processes, if you like, what we want to achieve as a group. Um, it's very much about us sharing what we've learned, what we've researched, so that we can kind of move on a bit in terms of your knowledge. It, we want it to be a very interactive session. We want to hear your experiences. There's quite a few little activities. Um, it's about sharing ideas, and hopefully what we will give you as output is not only food for thought and where to go next, but maybe some really useful practical tips or tools that you can use in your own teaching and practice. So, without further ado, we're going to move on to the first session. Martha and Nikki and Absentia are going to talk to you about troublesome knowledge and threshold concepts. Hello! Hi. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Martha Cadle and I was working with Nikki Newhouse, who has gone to the other university um, to start a new job now. She's actually also been incredibly sick as well, so she's actually just at home with her slides at the moment. So. Either way, whether she was still in St. Brooks or in her new job, she would not have been able to be here today. But uh, without further ado, I'm actually going to allow her to introduce the first three slides in the absence of the first Oh, and so in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to talk with you about so called threshold concepts and how they relate to student engagement in all of our classrooms. This links into a general question of how do we, as so called experts, teach difficult content confidently and effectively? We'll then explore the suggestion of working alongside our students and working towards conscious mastery and application of our subject matter rather than passive mimicry and replication. And finally, we'd like to share with you a set of resources we've developed, which we hope. Mm -hmm. oh. So, what are threshold concepts and why they matter to us as teachers? The idea of threshold concepts originated from a UK research project that set out to establish common characteristics of strong and effective undergraduate teaching and learning environments. The research was based on the field of economics, and lead researchers Eric Mayer and Ray Land noted that certain concepts were held by the lecturers involved to be fundamental to mastery of their subject. The notion of threshold concepts has since been widely embraced in higher education, and it's a concept that is instinctively recognisable across disciplines. We can all call to mind something that we teach that is central to a full understanding of our topic, but which can be troublesome for students to grasp, sometimes unexpectedly so. These concepts tend to share certain characteristics. For example, they're transformative. Once a student has understood the concept in question, he tends to view the entire discipline in a new, sometimes challenging way. Special concepts are also irreversible. They can, of course, be refined and even rejected, but they're difficult to unlearn once they've been grasped. They're integrative, bringing together different aspects of the subject that previously did not appear to be related. And finally, these concepts tend to be troublesome for the student, intellectually challenging, and as Mayor and Lander put it, akin to a pedagogic rite of passage. As Pillar's cousin says, there is no simple passage in learning from easy to difficult. Mastery of a threshold concept often involves messy journeys, back, forth, and across conceptual. I feel like I should be standing here like signing as well. <laughs> Unfortunately, my BSL is not particularly great, and also I don't think it was <coughs> it's probably not actually in the room who speaks to BSL anyway. Um, right, so I'm going to give you some examples from our peers of um, threshold concepts specifically. Nikki and I um, worked with the rest of our group to ask them for examples from their discipline as, as 
terms of what troublesome knowledge they dealt with, probably at quite a sort of early, you know, sort of stages, you know, in the, either in their modules or their courses. Um, yeah, the macroeconomics one is particularly interesting, I think, because it really is a big, huge, blue and great circle of by the time you get to the point where you should have an understanding or be able to start understanding the model of Fleming model of the economy, you've actually forgotten all of your basic knowledge of all of those other sort of more basic models which will inform your knowledge of the model of Fleming. So it does kind of demonstrate quite well of you know how we're trying to get our heads around you know, teaching those concepts that alone you know, in, in teaching them to our students in an engaging way which they can understand and also at a level that is high enough for us to be able to justify the level of teaching that we're supposed to be giving them. So it, it's quite a good example of that. Certainly in my own field, um, getting those students to be self-critical and also critical of others in um, an interesting, engaging and analytical way is actually really difficult. You know, they have real difficulty with, with proper critique and proper um, analysis of artwork of their own, where that comes from, and actually the, the artwork of others, and then sort of getting into people's mindsets of, of why they've made work. So they're kind of examples of what shops and knowledge could be. The nutrition one I think is really interesting as well. Um, I don't really entirely understand it, if I'm honest, because nutrition is definitely not my area. And the statistics one, I'm sure if Nikki was here, she could go into that more in depth, but it definitely, you know, she does go on to say later on that to talk about you know, statistics and, and the difficulty of that being a troublesome area because people immediately think that it's going to be very complicated for them to understand. So, this is the point where hopefully we start using our little resources, which hopefully you might be able to go on and use in your own teaching of threshold concepts and, and troublesome knowledge later on in, in your own undergraduate lectures or seminars. So I would like to ask you all how you are doing. Do you understand um, what I'm talking about? Do you understand the concept of what troublesome knowledge and threshold concepts are so far? If you have a very clear understanding, then please hold up your green card. If you have a kind of medium level understanding, think you're getting it but you might need a bit of clarification then you can hold up your amber card if you've got no idea what i'm talking about and i need to explain it in a different way that's more comprehensive to you then please hold up your red card now with the color facing the front <laughs> <laughs> okay so i've got a few ambers and one red so i am going to clarify what troublesome knowledge and threshold concepts are they are basically the fundamental cruxes of where our teaching and knowledge of our subject matter comes from. So, say, if we go back to the examples, you'll see that there are particularly complex theories or concepts in each different area that we teach, right across you know, the broad spectrum of, of this course and in academia in general. And some of those are completely and utterly fundamental to the understanding of the subject and therefore our students' progression through it. And, but they have to be understood for those students to be able to progress. So we need to find a way of teaching threshold concepts and difficult ideas, difficult theories in a way that students can understand and also master those concepts and not just mimic them, not just become parrots for, for how we tell them that it is, that they actually can understand the concept and apply it to, to various different areas. So does that help? <laughs> yeah? Yes. So orange yeah, oranges, greens, reds again. Okay. I've still got one red, but we have another we 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 do we do have another sort of little teaching method that I can use later on to hopefully clarify at the end of the lecture. So, the next task is using some post-it notes, which I have and my colleagues are very generously going to hand out. I would like you to take part in this activity. We're going to give you roughly five minutes to do this activity, so actually quite a long period of time. 
And I would like you to write down an example of a threshold concept that you have to teach within your subject area and a method that you use to help teach that to your students to help communicate that subject perhaps without presenting it as anything that's too difficult or at least you know, a, a, a useful method that you use to teach that approach. There's always a bottle in there. I've got a tablet, right? It's quite very well. Um, it's really well. Um, it's yeah, a bit digitally literate. Um, once you've done that, I would like you to please um, come up and put your post it on the board. And also take an opportunity to have a quick look at other examples and other teaching methods. So we're all kind of practice sharing a little bit. So you've got five minutes. And that starts at five minutes past three.
This is particularly apparent when a subject's reputation interacts with perhaps unreasonably high levels of perceived subject difficulty. In my subject area, teaching statistics and psychology, high levels of negative effects towards statistics of the subject tend to be coupled with low perceptions of usefulness of the subject as a whole and expectations of limited success if not outright failure. When interest is low and perceived difficulty is high, you can be pretty sure that engagement is about to go out the window. In 2012, Mazer developed the Student Interest Scale and Student Engagement Scale, which highlight the positive relationship between interest, student empowerment, student motivation, and effective learning. In particular, Mazer sought to evaluate the efficacy of specific teacher communication behaviours in connection with student engagement and anxiety levels. The two behaviours of primary interest were those of immediacy and clarity, demonstrated by increased eye contact, physical movement, facial expressions, and vocal variety, the development of one-to-one -one and peer relationships. So, back to threshold concepts. When we're teaching the fundamental building blocks of our subject, demonstrating best practice is therefore of paramount importance in order to stimulate both effective and cognitive interest, and crucially, to engage our students. So, we can make eye contact, we can move around, we can authentically engage with our students and use what Land, Cousin, Mayer and Davis call our third ear in order to listen out for the students' misunderstandings and uncertainties might actually be. We can actively demonstrate that we as teachers can tolerate learner confusion and support students as they traverse. Oh. Oh. Lost it again. Um, who, who else kind of gets the irony of what Nikki's talking about in that slide is that unfortunately, because she is physically not able to be in the room, we do have a very kind of interesting contradiction in terms and the fact that this isn't particularly engaging. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah. Okay. So, so we have some students who actually kind of find it quite engaging to just kind of sit and listen. Uh, we have others who perhaps don't find that engaging at all and found it really difficult to kind of concentrate on the content of that slide. Again, I mean, you know, you'll, you'll get all this as part of the electronic resources of PAC. I'll make sure that you get Nikki's script, so if it's easier for you to have, perhaps read the content of her script rather than just listen to her talk. I was trying to encourage her to actually film herself and do a video so she could have eye contact with you. Certainly as a lecturer from my point of view, I think that's really important, but she was, she was very reticent at all to, to make, the, um, <laughs> make the narration because she hates the sound of her own voice, so I can kind of understand that. So, I've got a couple of videos to show you and in, in to hopefully give some context to how we tackle the tough stuff. And I went and found a couple of resources. There's a little video I'm going to show you on how I, of, of what I always play to my students to introduce them to the idea of making critique. And this is just something that I use to give a, a kind of framework to, to what I'm talking about rather than explain to them definitely what critique is. Hopefully it's going to work. It's thinking about it, isn't it? Mm. This computer is struggling. I can feel it growing on the middle. On the okay. <laughs> <laughs> While we're waiting for that to catch up with this, I'm going to hand out these, if you wouldn't mind.
Bullshit, Mama. Post-its 
because we've done a little bit of cross practice sharing today, there will be further examples in there that we can, you know, send out to, to everyone so we're able to engage with new teaching methods and new possibilities of making threshold concepts not just more easy, so not just easier to understand, but also more interesting and more engaging for our students, so they are able to master them rather than just me. And now I'm going to hand over to my lovely colleagues, Christine and Simone, for the next section of the presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, so the next section is the still deals with engagement, and in particular it deals with diversity and engagement. I know what you're thinking. Diversity. Boring. Again. I know. We went through diversity a lot during this module, last semester also. That's why we try to make it fun. So we link <laughs> diversity with engagement. So we will engage you. Actually, you will do the job. We won't do much. You will see. So basically, I will just introduce a couple of slides, a few words, and then read. You do the job. So, basically, we all know we have a diverse cohort of students. Diversity can mean a lot of things. Actually, in the first seminar, we learned that students are diverse in terms of digital literacy. What else? What else can we think about? Dimensions of diversity. Why are our students diverse? In which respect? Background. Background, origin, origin and background, age, okay. age. political orientation, sexual orientation, political orientation, political orientation, Even sexual orientation. Orientation. political orientation, what else? Religion, religion, what else? Disability, gender, disability, gender, what else? Interested. No, pre-existing knowledge. Pre ah, pre-existing. Okay. Existing knowledge. So you see, we can think about a lot of dimensions of diversity, and hopefully we will show you that actually there are even more. And going to the you do the job part, how do you engage such a diverse cohort of students? Okay, we may think about a million different uh, diversity aspects of our students. We need to engage them all, okay? but they're very diverse. How do you do that? So in this, in this question, we ask, hey, okay, how do you do that in terms of materials, classroom delivery, assessment, consistency? And so you can think of anything you want. But the point is, discuss it with your neighbor, form groups, whatever, try to discuss it, and come out with some answer on the post-its. And then we collect the post-its, you get exposed to a short presentation, some slides, Christina will do that, while we collect the post-its, and at the end of the presentation, we go back to your answers, and we try to come up with something which is useful for everybody. So, how do you engage a diverse student cohort, knowing that diversity means a lot of things? So, from groups, discuss it, you have five minutes, I mean, it's up to you. <laughs> if you have questions, go around. Big groups are good. Yeah, I don't think it's not really just to do it, but I just want to design the slide. 
Don't see where Fiona gets her response from. Uh, yes, that's why I call me. Thank you, guys. Yeah. yeah. Guys, Shumo won. Thank you for your inputs. We will get back to your inputs at the end of a short set of slides. Christine is Everyone has just a Yeah, this is uh, a little bit about the, the kind of background to why we're seeing uh, an increase in diversity because we're all 
you know, quite familiar with it, and we should also probably be quite familiar with uh, educational policies, both at the national level and on the institutional level. But these are just a few kind of snippets that kind of show, you know, how government inquiries was giving specific rec recommendations to widening participation in 97, and also how since 2003, the Skills and Education Department have a uh, new, uh, or they measure their access differently. And so diversity is growing and um, it's, it's already quite established uh, as the landscape of our teaching practice. Um, also important is actually the changes to legislation. Um, and we might be more or less familiar with these. And also just how much has actually happened quite recently. Um, and they all kind of work towards, you know, they start and have an ambition to create a much more equal opportunity society. Um, and they of course have, you know, affected our education policies, but they also affect us directly in what we can and cannot do when we teach. And so it's important that we take them into account in so in order so we don't unwittingly break the law um, by not um, actually accommodating them in our practice. So to put in perspective what uh, diversity means to teaching practice, we've tried to sort of map uh, some day-to-day -day issues in order to position and highlight some of the pedagogic challenges that we face and what they question in regard to practice and engagement. Um, and so, you know, we've got disability, I mean, a lot of the things that you all mentioned previously, um, so the, the, the kind of basic knowledge and skills, the abstracted, you know, non-university background, language barriers, disabilities, um, and most of these things are actually more unseen and seen issues. Um, and then, you know, that means that we have to kind of plan and keep the standards of our course, prepare material and perform and communicate and assess in a landscape where we are responding to a diverse range of prior skills, disciplinary knowledge and experiences, diverse range of cultural as well as subcultural understandings, practices and awareness, and a diverse range of hidden and visible medical and social conditions. Um, so what's out there to help us do this well? Um, we found some but uh, limited student research, which is kind of some studies that we have. And they actually, you know, as an overall, they really talk about the learning environment and learning relationships, and which are actually kind of quite tangible on a human level. Um, and and it's things that we can relate to, uh, I think, quite easily. Uh, also out there are um, things about uh, engagement strategies and inclusive learning research, and where the, the, the which are quite useful reflective tools and kind of just pull out a few points, the, the mapping of teaching practices to individual cognitive, so the first one up there, uh, cognitive, emotional and behavioural domains, um, is kind of, sounds good, but how feasible is it in practice? And I think, you know, a lot of that depends on what kind of model structures we're teaching in. Um, Another one, reviewing communication, written and oral, is on the other much more feasible, but then um, we need to assess and formulate the criteria that should inform it. Um, and also reflecting on relationships and behaviour, which mirrors the student research and also relates to commun communication of both formal and informal nature. Um, in some aspects of the inclusive learning research um, suggests stimulating associative learning through linking content to contextual relevance, 
which was also pointed out earlier, and the individual's prior knowledge, making resourceful use of the cohort, uh, cohort diversity, whilst also making the individual feel, feel like they can bring something to the table and take part. Uh, it also suggests to put efforts and measure, measure, measures towards minimizing mismatching perceptions by implementing greater transparency, for instance, in regard to assessment. And I think we probably all have experienced a kind of mismatch of perceptions in terms of expectations and so on and so forth. Um, so, when put in perspective, this kind of proposes and highlights the relationship between student research and the engagement strategies and inclusive learning. It also makes apparent that the vastness of considerations which has become relevant to teaching practice from environment and behaviour through to content and methodologies. The situating all of these aspects relatively draws a complex picture of the diversity realm. However, it also suggests methods in which to reflect on our current practices in order to inform new practices for engagement. So this is really where your answers comes back in again, um, because it's a multi-layered thing and there's no conclusive answer, but um, we'd like to kind of get more ideas that we can then kind of feedback and exchange and share. Yeah. So basically, most of you Okay, so it was nice to, to collect the, the answers because we can identify three broad areas where you where you are. So most of you basically uh, suggested that we need to start from some simple stuff, a baseline, uh, establish some uh, simple and clarifying some simple concepts, and then build on those concepts. So this could suit a very diverse cohort of students. But basically. The vast majority of you suggest that feedback can be a way to deal with diversity. Feedback got in, that, that you can get in many different ways. Actually, one-to-one face-to-face sessions, office hours, seminars, small tutorials. And one of you suggested that well, we could make the students decide the method of delivery. This is a way of getting feedback even before the class. Okay. What do, you, what do you want me to do to explain this concept? I think it's getting feedback even before going to the class. So, simple concepts, getting feedback from the students, and then many suggested a multimodal approach. So, use technology, use different ways to deliver the same concepts. So, maybe one, one way does not fit all the students, well, use another way, use another way, use another uh, media, and then in the end you get to everybody. So these are the three main areas that you that you suggested, and they fit. They more or less fit around the theme: critical reflection on practice and engagement, and also inclusive learning. This has to do with feedback and gathering feedback and uh, and trying to engage as much students as you can. So I think more or less you identify areas that are incorporated into the real of diversity engaged practice. So, summing up, we, I think we have some kind of final questions, which is more on a yes-no kind of level. And uh, should we think of constructing a framework to accommodate student diversity and engagement within our department or within the institution or, uh, or maybe even kind of undergraduate level at within our subject field, you know, uh, is that something that you would find helpful in terms of preparing your education? I think we could go back to the green and the red. Uh, and so I'm green for yes and, and red for no. I didn't really quite understand the question, I think. Okay. Can you read it? Sorry. Um, so the question is whether you, well, actually the question is, do you think that there's something within your department or university that actually helps you prepare your teaching practice in regard to diversity? Okay. And if there isn't, would you find that helpful? I think I would have liked 
have something like this to be discussed more, I think, you know, rather than a framework. This is not about framework. This is actually learning, you know, from your colleagues. And I would rather have a sort of discussion of this. Something like an awakening. You just keep a small slot, you know, you all of you meet once in a year. If there's some of this important, you keep that as one of the issues and discuss it. So everybody will learn from that. Rather than, you know, it's okay, but that's the way we get it. Yeah. yeah, basically, I mean, this is more a food for thought, okay, we, it's a very short presentation, so these are all things that we, we can think about, we can, I mean, hopefully they will, they will be discussed, even, but yes. Can I just say, while we're on that point, if any department or anyone wants to have within their department something like you just suggested, please get in contact with me and I'll happily, <coughs> I'll happily put, facilitate a workshop on that. You see, and we didn't even know. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. So we can move on to the next section, the last section of our presentation. Victor? Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm glad that the, one of the areas that you identified I wanted to ensure negative engagement was the use of uh, technology in order to, to achieve so. So what I'm going to uh, say in this part, I'm going to show you this part of the presentation is precisely that the impact of technology in the classroom as, as, as a tool to engage students in the learning process. I would like to start this part of the presentation by quoting uh, the words of Elias Power, the president of this uh, company NC. Information Infrastructure and Cloud Services, which is a leading company in information technology. Uh, the numbers uh, actually show here that this is a authority figure to talk about technology and use of technology. What I, I think Elias Howard actually hit the, 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 the nail on the head when he says that they were well into the information age where we need students notable in science, technology, engineering, and maths in order to satisfy employment demands in a wide range of uh, industries. And yet, our students are being instructed using a 20th century model, and as a result of that, they are graduating without the uh, skills that are needed for today's jobs. And that makes them able to excel, excel in, a digital, in a digital environment. And that is still a shame, because uh, we have an unprecedented access to, to um, resources and tools and technologies that can actually facilitate learning. Uh, this prompts us to actually investigate a bit more what is uh, going on in, in, in Brooks uh, in that, and on that, say, along those lines. So what we did, it was a little bit of research and investigated the importance of ICT resources in the classroom. And for this, the way we did, we, we did this research was through, the, through two independent surveys. The methodology we used for this is as follows. We prepared two questionnaires, one was distributed to 21 uh, undergrad students at the end of the chemistry practical in order to assess if the use of, the, uh, the use of digital technology in the classroom actually enhanced the understanding of the practical. And a second independent questionnaire was also prepared to ask 111 undergrads of the same faculty uh, as to whether the allowing the use of personal digital technology in the classroom was considered to be an aid or an abstraction. The results are summarized as follows. So for the first questionnaire, we asked, do you feel that the use of a PowerPoint presentation to introduce the practical prior to the running of the practical was helpful? And the vast majority of the students respond, yes, actually that, uh, that is uh, sort of helpful. We also asked if the end of the practical was clear at the end of the practical, we asked whether the, the, the aim was, was clear. The majority of them say yes. And we also asked, how many times did you read the instructions of the practical prior to the session? And the large majority say, well, I read it 50% of them almost say we read it once. 48% um, or so say we read it two or more. And apparently, everybody read these instructions of the practical prior to the run of it. And I went to one classroom, well, which is great. Um, <laughs> I'm going to come back to this point, um, but before that, let me just move on and present the results of a second questionnaire in which we ask, do you think that technology, such as uh, iPhones, laptops, in the classroom helps or hinders your learning? As you can see, two-thirds of the respondents say, well, actually it helps, whereas one-third of them say, actually, it's a bad idea. 
The results of the questionnaire are presented here, but I would uh, ask Miriam, is not physically present here today, but uh, she's going to explain the results for you. Oh, what is the audio? Yeah. I think on the, in the, the mouse. Oh, technology. Yeah. No, I can't see that. I can't see that. Yeah. Yeah. Just. Okay, well, I'm going to then I'll show you that we are actually prepared audio for us, explaining these the results. So, the, the question we have, okay, the, the answer to the question was a uh, uh, vast majority of the students didn't bring a laptop to the classroom. Um, however, most of them I use a smartphone in, in, the, in, the, in the classroom. And the reasons for that, oh sorry, bring a, a, a smartphone to the, to the classroom, but they turn it off. And the reason for that is because uh, a, a majority, the majority of students responded that is because they, that helps them to stay focused. Uh, others say that is because they have respect for the, for the lecturer. Um, others say, well, there's no need to, to have it on, on, in, in the classroom. Well, some say it was very ecological answers to say the bathroom. Mm -hmm. So, another question we ask is. Well, I'm trying to I'm stepping on top of this for the Attention, and that is 
school. In this particular school, the Waterloo School, which is based in Silicon Valley, I don't need to convince you about the importance of, of this, uh, uh, of this, of, 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 of this uh, place in, in, the, in the development of the like, innovation in the 20th and 21st century, where three quarters of the, of the, of the students' parents work for these uh, high-tech companies like Google, um, Apple, and Yahoo. And interestingly enough, the school doesn't allow computers in the classroom and prefers students not to use them at home. And the parents and teachers all agree on this. And the reason for that, one of the reasons for this, is that they believe that meaningful engagement comes uh, first and foremost from teachers and peers. And computers and technology are more of a distraction than a resource. So it's, again, it's a concept of matter. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. And more arguments against the use of technology in the classroom include this. Um, in, that, in a nutshell, say that the online instruction videos and programs, you name it, they don't really compare with the experience of having a face-to-face -face discussion in which the students not only have the opportunity to ask questions, but also have the opportunity to, to have a say in what is discussed in the, in the classroom, and hear the opinions of parents and, peers and teachers. And this level of interaction is just can't be replicated on a computer screen. One of the important reasons that actually parents are, are a, um, uh, a mentioning uh, often uh, 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 in the use against, uh, against the use of technology in the classroom is that it's imperative that students learn how to socialize without technology. They're becoming very much dependent on technology and they're not socializing in, 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 other, in other ways. And, and again, parents and teachers believe this uh, through the engagement with teachers that learn, children learn part of life lessons, such as respect, manners, and self esteem. And still, both consider that having a teacher uh, in, a in, in a classroom is one of the most important factors in, in the development of, of the skills and abilities and the students going to succeed. There is one report, and, and along those lines, the Department of Education actually. Um, ask for, uh, for uh, to this organization Vecta to uh, produce a report <coughs> on the, uh, to assess the impact of technology in the classroom. This is uh, when it was 2010, it was the final report, and what they said is uh, the report actually showed that most of the, of the, of the learning practice in ICT devices is dedicated to exposition and construction. But importantly, is other activities such as tutorials, uh, stimulation, and case-based learning are actually very, very touched in the, in the car of using ICT devices. And again, there are, the, the most exception of these are, these are, there are effective forms of teaching that do not uh, require ICT tools, and it's quite opposite. Yeah. yeah. We might just need to skip to the end because I'm concerned to be finished. Oh, um, yeah, well, that's about, I have to finish, actually. This is just to show that uh, again, this is a, it's a, a, a lot of ongoing research uh, on this on this issue. One interesting program is this called Visitors and Residents, which is a partnership between uh, the other University and North Carolina. And the program aims to identify potential differences in approaches in teaching between the US and the UK uh, students and, and also uh, scholars. So far, the research has found no significant shifts in the mode of engagement by the students when they transit from high school to university. I find it very, very interesting. So what is going on in the rest of Europe? This is just to show that this is almost the last slide. So this seems to be because there's a European Union is, is funded a conference just to dedicate, dedicated to explore more about the impact of technology in the classroom, the edition of this year is in Brighton. I find it very encouraging. Visit the website and find it has a lot of information about places to visit when you are attending the conference, London, they South in Ken, Sussex, London, but there is very little question about the conference itself, keynote and featured speakers are still to be appointed, and the program is still to be defined, which I find very frustrating. In summary, what I presented here is that the use of ICT resources to introduce practicals in, in, in groups was welcomed by the most of the students. A large fashion of teaching staff do not use some of the ICT resources that are very popular among the students, such as Twitter Fit, which is also interesting and boring at the same time. And the time and the STEM ICT resources recommended for the use in the classroom are aspects of intense research and debate. To finalize, we'd like to invite you 
uh, to express your opinions, suggestions, share experience on these issues, any issue on the underpinning yes. student engagement. And for that, you can follow us on Twitter. It's a hashtag mindset of you. And uh, with that, I think, thank you for your attention. You will present it on the Sorry, thanks. So, in brief conclusion, first of all, what we have aimed to do is to give you some actual things to take away. You've got your red, orange, and green cards, and you've got your toolkit that Mark and Brett have put together. Second, uh, you know, where do you go from here? So hopefully we have got you thinking about things, and um, with the use of some of the resources that we will share subsequent to this session, you'll be able to see where else we go with this. Obviously, there are other areas of student engagement you can look at. And finally, we will get everything onto Moodle. Thank you for your attention. Landscape is changing. Bacta, we reported to Bacta has been closed. The GIST is being wound up as an R&D funding organization too. So, yeah, um, really interesting developments uh, afoot thanks to current policy.